Good morning. <laughs> you all look great today. How many are glad you didn't lose an hour last night and it didn't snow this morning? <laughs> Already a better day than it was last Sunday, right? I'm so thrilled that you're here and uh, to see those uh, children dedicated. It's, it's so precious. You might not know this in, in the next service, eight more babies being dedicated. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, I know. We have lots of babies around here. How many think that's a really good thing? Yeah. yeah. So I don't know if you love your job or hate your job, but you might not be aware of how much Scripture has to say about your job. And so we're going to take a look at that this morning. We're in a series in Genesis, and we're discovering how God originally designed and created us and the world around us has huge implications in terms of how we think about how we interact and interface with others and with responsibilities. So you've already heard a couple of these verses this morning in Genesis chapter 1. It says, God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and over all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth, subdue it, rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over every living creature that moves on the ground. And then God said, I will give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it, so that they will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw that all he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Continuing on into chapter 2, it says, Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. And by the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Down to verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. Uh, you were probably asked as a child a question, what do you want to be when you grow up? And some of you stuck to that, like you, that was the vocation you became and, and others of us made adjustments along the way. And you've probably asked that same question to other children that come in and out of your life. What's interesting is that we don't ask the question, what do you want to do? We ask the question, what do you want to be? Somehow we equate how we earn a living in a world with our identity. There was one little boy that someone asked him, what do you want to be when you grow up? And he said, kind. Don't you wish more of us thought like that? But we don't. So Genesis is really important in terms of how we think about work. And we're, we're surprised because we're, we're given information that's very different. We won't be surprised today when I talk about it. Most of the world, especially in ancient cultures, it was a revolutionary concept. And so Genesis reveals that God works. God works works. He described all of his work of creation as work. And this is really interesting because in most of the other religions of the world, the gods do not work. The gods create people to do the work. They consider work to be menial and beneath them and something that they wouldn't want to do. Work is considered demeaning. Yeah. People don't always have, people don't always have a high opinion of work. Um, in fact, I've even heard some people say that they believe work is, is part of the curse that came on human beings when they fell. God assigned work before the fall. What the fall did was that it increased the amount of effort that would go in and decreased the amount of potential that would come out. But work was always part of God's plan, and he assigned that to us. So 
Some work we hold in higher value, some work we hold in lesser value. By and large, that value is, is demonstrated in how much someone is willing to pay you to do something. But what you should know is that the value of work, according to God's word, is not determined by your compensation. And in fact, in God's word, there's no such thing as demeaning work. It all has value. So God works. That's a surprise. There's another thing here. God blesses. We often read verse 28 where he's saying, you know, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, rule. We see that as a command, but it says God blessed. And blessing means that God is actually giving a capacity. He's empowering. Uh, he's encouraging people to step out of comfort zones and begin to, to try options that maybe they wouldn't have otherwise. Be fruitful. And this is what he says. Be fruitful. What does that mean? It means to flourish. Uh, I, I used to own a house in Jamestown, New York, that had several apple trees and two pear trees. And I know you might think that sounds wonderful, but all those apples would fall down on the ground. And in order to mow the lawn, you either had to pick them up or you had applesauce a lot of weeks out of the year. So flourish, increase in number, increase not, not only create more humans in the world, but increase has to do with doing great things, coming into maturity. And then he says, fill the earth because there are places in the earth that are still empty and it needs to be filled. But there's also a concept about filling that has to do with satisfaction. There are, there are meals when you are done eating. You, you, you put your hand on your stomach usually and a smile on your face and you, you step back away from the table and you go, I am full. How many like that feeling? Yeah? See? I'm full. So fill the earth. Subdue. And this sounds like control. It sounds like some kind of domination taking place, but that's, that's not actually what's happening. It is bringing something under control. For example, a person might say that they, they subdued their impulse to laugh out loud in the room. No one was controlling them. They just decided not to act on that impulse. They, they brought it under control. It's, it's a kind of direction. It's, it's reining something in. And uh, it, back in the days when they, people used to use horses and things, uh, animals like that for transportation, you would actually use the reins to help determine what the pace of the creature would be, but also the direction. If you just tug a little bit to the right, then the, the horse would move to the right. So there's this idea that, that we would exercise bringing some things under control for the purpose of direction and speed, right? And then rule, which is to exercise influence. It says, we're to rule, what does he say? Rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the sky, over every living creature that moves on the ground. What is God saying? God is saying, I give you authority to exercise dominion, to rule over what? Natural resources. This is really important because a lot of people think that this is the verse of scripture that you are allowed to dominate other people. That if I hold a position of authority, that somehow I have some level of control over you. And that's not what scripture teaches in the beginning. We're supposed to exercise control over natural resources. And somebody says, well, how does that work? I, I can give you a perfect example. We're in a room right now that was built because we came to our church back in the fall of 2018 and we talked about creating more space so more people could experience more of God's grace. There wasn't any arm twisting. There wasn't any manipulation. There wasn't any attempt to control people's decisions. We just gave the option and made the invitation and then people exercised authority over their own resources. And the result is you are in a room today because people exercised authority over those resources. How many are glad that they did that? And, and yes, right? And many of you did that. 
a couple weeks ago, we came to our church family and we said, uh, there are refugees, over three million now, that are fleeing Ukraine because of the invasion of Russian forces there. And uh, they're, they're often having to leave everything behind. Uh, sometimes all the family members can't go and they're fleeing into nearby countries. And so there are organizations, and, and one that we use in particular, where 92% of everything that we donate actually gets into the hands of the people who need it. And if you don't know anything about uh, uh, organizations like that, that's a phenomenal number. And so we're so thrilled to be able to work with them. But we didn't manipulate. We, we didn't intimidate. We just provided the opportunity and asked if you were willing to exercise authority over your own resources to help participate in that. And you did that. And last week, we sent out a check for over $13,000 to help uh, people who are struggling with having food to eat and having a place to sleep. How many think that's a really good thing? Yeah. And in case you're wondering, if you give more, we will send more. We, we, don't, we don't keep that to ourselves. That's a good thing. See, when people exercise dominion, other people are helped. When people exercise domination, other people are hurt. Under domination, countries get invaded. Under dominion, people are helped. Um, this is a really interesting concept, this idea about dominion versus domination. Um, I know people believe that, I, I've heard this, and now I'm going to annoy a couple of you, and I'm not doing it on purpose, but I, I, there's a point I need to make. I've heard this phrase, this is the most divided our country has ever been, not even close. There was this thing called the Civil War where more Americans died in it than any other war we've ever participated in and almost as many as all the other wars combined. How many think that's pretty divisive? Yeah. You think the arguments you had with your family recently <laughs> over COVID was bad? They didn't just yell at each other, they shot each other. That was not good. It's most divided time, nope, not really. What's interesting is that even in our time, though people tend to be polarized on topics, on the majority of issues, the majority of people actually agree what needs to be done and can even agree on how to go about it. The issue is not, should, is this important and how should we do it? The issue is, who's in control politically? And so if your political party is in control and they want to do this, what they will notice is the other political party will drag their feet. Why do they drag their feet? Because they don't want that political party to get credit. Well, I think that's an important issue and I think it should be dealt with, but I think it should only be dealt with if my political party is in control. That's domination. That's not exercising dominion. That's a corruptive influence in the system that God created. If we're more concerned about who gets credit than we are actually helping people, something is, has gone wrong. And this is the way our world is in these days. And it's challenging. The way we create and manage resources, how do we do this? The way we create and manage resources is through work. And a lot of people ask, so what am I supposed to do with my life? And we wish somebody would tell us. So here, if you don't know, or if you want to re-examine the options, here are four things to look for in a job from Scripture. All right? Number one, look with humility. Take a humble look at your own ability, your own capacities, your own uh, 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 gifts, the things that you are able to do, and, and pay attention to that, all right? So for me to say, I want to be a player in the NFL. Do you know what I'm qualified to do? Watch players in the NFL. That's what I'm qualified to do. When I left high school, I finally made the weight necessary to be on the football team in middle school. <laughs> Just saying. 
And then I lost some weight after that. And it wasn't until I'd been married for five years that I would have qualified to be back on the high school or the middle school football team. That, that's kind of what, so, so, so I can have dreams all day long. I think I'd be great. I think I'd get killed. That's what I think would happen. Oh, I, I want to be in the NBA. There, there is nobody my size in the NBA. It's just how it works. See, we have to be humble. What's true about me? And, and here's our challenge, is often we're inspired by what we've seen in someone else and we want to be like that person, rather than asking ourselves, what is it that I'm good at? What is it that I'm interested in? How can I use the gifts, the abilities, the capacities that God has placed in me to make a difference? Secondly, look with compassion. So look with humility, but look with compassion. A lot of times we're, we're ruled by our passion instead of by our compassion. There's something we have a great love for, but we don't think about who it could actually help. Scripture calls us to use our gifts and our abilities with, and, and connect them with someone else's need. This is a really important thing. The, the question is, what am I good at? And then who could benefit from it? That's a really useful thing to think about. Here's our challenge, is that sometimes we look at something that we're good at and we like, but it doesn't pay enough for us. And so now we want a job that pays more. So we, we, we don't make our decision based on our gifts. We make our decision based on the potential earning capacity of a particular area of work. And then we pursue that and we wind up hating our jobs. It doesn't matter. If you hate your job, eventually there will be no amount of money that will make it worthwhile. And then, in addition to, to figuring out what it is that you're, you're good at, you actually have to connect it to people who need it. And here's the challenge. Some people are good at something, but they want to avoid some of the very people who would benefit the most from that. That's not a good option. So, what we want to do is, Look with humility, look with compassion, and then look to make something better. Look to make something better. When you feel like you've improved something, there's a sense of accomplishment. I bought a very old house. It was made and it was first built in 1906 in Jamestown, New York. It actually was my grandmother's house. And uh, after I bought it from her, one of the things I wanted to do was to paint it, except there were so many layers of paint over all of the decades that had been around. And it was really difficult to try to scrape it down. So I decided to burn all the paint off of all the outside, which I did, which takes a long time. But I remember doing something. I'd paint off or burn off a section, and, and originally I was doing it with a little blowtorch and, and, and a scraper. And then I almost caught the house on fire. And, and I, I thought to myself, if I burn this house down, the neighbors are going to tell the fire department and the insurance company. He was trying to do it for weeks, and he finally succeeded. He was out there, I saw him, and it took him that long, but he finally got it done. So, so then I got a hot air gun and, and, and I went at it that way. And I can remember doing sections of it and climbing down off the scaffold and stepping back and just, and just standing there and looking at it. What, what am I doing? I'm making an improvement. I'm making something better. See, in the Garden of Eden, God did not create the garden to be a museum where, where Adam and Eve would go around and they'd go, well, well look at that plant. Oh, that's a plant. <laughs> Don't touch there was only one, one case where they weren't supposed to, to eat of a, a particular tree. Everything else was theirs. And so often we think about the garden and we think about life in this museum kind of way where we're not supposed to touch it or interact with it or make it any better. God gives us good things, but he intends us to make them better. God intends us to improve our world. There are some people who think that the best the world has ever been is the day that God finished his creation and that was its pristine form and the goal is somehow to go back to that. That's not God's idea. He put man in the garden to work it and to manage it. 
He wanted improvements to be made. And there's a sense of accomplishment when we feel like we are making improvements. If, if a person is a doctor, they feel like they're making improvements in other people's health. The teacher feels like they're improving a capacity of a student to learn and opening doors of opportunity in their life because of it. A groundskeeper improves the appearance of, of nature itself. So Because if we just let nature go around here, the grass would be really it would look like something that you wouldn't want to participate in. But there are people who make a difference. They improve it. A hairstylist. Thank God for hairstylists. I've seen what a couple of you look like when you missed an appointment. And we just, we're grateful for what the hairstylists do. Sanitary workers say, oh, I would never want to be a sanitary worker. But let me ask you a question. Would you want to live in a culture where there were no sanitary workers? I do not think so. They, they, they bring health and safety to our community by being able to remove from us the things that might be harmful to us. And a chef, how many are so grateful the way chefs improve food? Oh, that's, that's a good thing. And a counselor improves the mental health of a client or a patient. And an artist improves the beauty and the creativity of a community. And banks and investors improve the development of businesses. They're not just trying to make money. They're actually trying to make a difference in a community. And construction workers improve the quality and functionality of facilities and people in law improve our capacity to make sure that those who want to do harm are put in a place where they're not, they don't have that option and people who have been accused of doing wrong that were actually innocent not only have their day in court but can live a free life afterwards. And that's just scratching the surface of all the kinds of things that can be improved. Look for a way to make something better and then look to rest. If we're working from an unhealthy paradigm, we will actually sacrifice rest and probably family and friendships and our own health in order to get what we hope we will, will have by all of our work. But God rested after, seven day, or after six days, and it wasn't because he was tired. It's because he wanted to sit back and value and appreciate what he had made. Some people never enjoy the fruit of their labor. Listen to what it says in the book of Ecclesiastes. By the way, this, this is written by Solomon, one of the wisest people to ever live in human history. This is what I have observed to be good, right? This is good. That it is appropriate for a person to eat. I mean, we could just say amen right there, right? Amen. To drink and to find satisfaction in their toilsome labor under the sun during the few days of life God has given them. For this is their lot. Moreover, when God gives someone wealth, and in case you're wondering, compared to most of the world, we all are. When God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and be happy in their toil, this is a gift of God. See, we are called to worship through our work, not worship our work. If we don't believe how much God values us, we will constantly try to earn that value through our occupation or our vocation. Now, I'll be the first to acknowledge to you that there is some work that's not good, work that is deceptive and dishonest, work that destroys and tears down, work that distorts truth. Those, that's, all of that is an example of, of work that is not good. It's not good for people who do that kind of work and take advantage of other people. That's not what it's about. But Colossians chapter 3 tells us that in all the work that we have to do, we should do the very best that we possibly can because... You're not working for another person and you're not working for another company. You're working for God. I'm going to have the worship team come out. Think about that. You're not working for another person. You're not working for another company. You're working for God. Now you might be sitting there and going, oh, pastor, I can tell you. I've, I, I looked at my pay stub and I know who, who issued that check and it wasn't God. Oh, no, no, no. You're working for God. God's just making them pay you for it. So the question becomes, how can you make your work Christian work? That's a good question. Because some people think that in order for it to be Christian work, you have to work in a church or a religious nonprofit. That's not true. 
Some people think for it to be Christian work, you've got to put up religious symbols around your cubicle or your office or on your machine. And that's what makes it Christian. That, that's also not true. You want to make your work Christian work? Take what you're doing and try to make it better. Because that was what God designed you to do. When we do as little as possible, it gives, it gives place to the disintegrating powers of chaos in our world. No one's inspired by it. No one really appreciates it. And the thing is, is that when our world starts eroding, something inside of us does too. You were made in the image of God and in his likeness. So he calls you to be faithful in little because scripture says if you're faithful in little, if you're trying to improve what little you have, God says, I'll actually give you more. Why? It, he's, not, he's not just trying to bribe us. This is what he's saying. When I give that person something, they manage it well and they make things better. And I want the resources of my world to be used like that. And so he starts increasing your potential. Be faithful in little. God will give you more. Giving your best where you are is not wasting your gifts. It's investing in your future. Even if it feels like no one notices, God notices. And God works and blesses. And you were created in his image and his likeness. You can be a worker. You can be a blesser in our world. Let's bow our heads. Uh, Father, um, I have no doubt there are people who would be dissatisfied with aspects of their job. And maybe, maybe it's time for a transition in their own life. Maybe there's other options or opportunities they should take a look at. But whether we're exercising those options or not, would you help us today to understand that you value the work that we do, that you know how important it is in the world that we live in, and that our value is not in the compensation we receive or the amount of work that we get off our desk today. Our value is because you created us in your image and your likeness, and when we fell, and we broke our lives in ways we could not repair ourselves. You sent your son to demonstrate to us how valuable we are to you. He gave his one and only life so you could have us back healed and whole. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.